Thank you all for coming to talk on Public Square today about cancer and connecting cultures. And Carmen Gloria, I'd like to start with you. Talk about why you were reluctant to get screened and how that finally happened. Well, I knew that being over 40 years old, I have to get screened. And, but because the lack of insurance, I didn't actually want it to, to do it because I didn't have any money to pay. But also, it was that I thought that when they were talking about breast cancer, it wasn't for me. It's like they were talking for another people, not to me. And I received an email and I heard that Casa de Salud is a clinic here that was uh, helping you with mammogram for free. So I went to the mammogram and they found it there that I have a little lump and they did a biopsy. So they actually um, took like a week to call me. I decided to, to go on vacation to New York. So I was driving there with my husband in a freeway full of car everywhere. And I received a call from the image center. And she said, uh, I have to let you know that you have breast cancer. Mm. Just like that. Something is like a courting was covered all over. I wasn't able to see anything. Thank God I wasn't driving. So I said, I'm sorry, could you repeat what you just say? And she said, yes, you have breast cancer. I said, but, but can, can you, can you uh, transfer me to somebody that speaks my language? So she said, no, we don't have anybody here that speaks Spanish. I'm just a receptionist. And I said, but could you tell me how, how long I'm gonna live? Can you, because all these questions come and say, what is, when I'm gonna die? Because cancer is like death for us, it's like that. So she said, no, no, I'm sorry. Uh, we don't know yet. Uh, probably somebody will call you uh, to set up a doctor appointment. And I said, but okay, so I, I have to hang up because I wasn't able to speak anymore in English. It was the worst news that I ever received in my life. So I said, I need to come back to Albuquerque. I need to save my life. I, I need to do whatever, whatever I have to do to be able to survive. And so I called my best friend, um, was actually very sad, crying with me. And she said, let me see if I can help, if I can find some help. And she found the Comadre Comadre program. So I did call Elba and she was talking to me for three hours. She was giving me all the support. She was telling me, you are not gonna die. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I said, but Elba, I don't have insurance. How am I gonna get treatment? I mean, I'm gonna die faster than anyone because I don't have any, I don't know how to pay. And she said, don't worry, we will figure it out that. It was a very, actually, important support. It was amazing. Somebody was talking to me in my own language about my issue, and somebody was telling me that not everything was done. I mean, that I, I was able to live more. Dalila, you are one of the co-founders of Comadre yes, with I am. Elva. You're also a survivor. I'm a survivor. It'll be 20 years this, this June. I had just gone in for my usual yearly stuff, and I ended up with uh, having to go and see, I mean, seeing a specialist. I had to actually go in and have the lump removed and then it came back positive. All the news, all the results were given to me in her office. It was never done by phone. And that's when I started my journey with my chemo and my radiation. Where did you find support? I found a lot of support with my coworkers. I had a son here and a sister here in Albuquerque, which unfortunately I didn't have any support. Your family did not? No. Why? Uh, I think there were just, my son, I know he, the fear of maybe death for me, which this is what I thought too, because I had just lost my mother three years prior to my diagnosis from pancreatic cancer. And my sister, of course, probably maybe if she, she figured, well, my sister has it, I'll probably get cancer myself too. I had a daughter who lived in Santa Fe, but unfortunately I just couldn't see her coming to every appointment to support me, to be there with me. She would call me and see how I was doing, but I always told her, I'm fine, I'm fine. But Are you um, trying to be strong for your family? I was. I'm the oldest in the family, so growing up I had a lot of responsibilities because I was the oldest. I did work 
also throughout my journey. But I was trying to protect my, my, my family life. It's OK. I just had to find it within myself that I could do this. Did you go to support groups? I did start going to a support group. The majority of ladies were Anglo. There was only one Hispanic woman. Um, but I just couldn't connect. I, there was just nothing there that I could relate myself, other than the cancer. Helen, you also had a diagnosis, and you are a survivor. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Do any, either of these experiences sound similar to anything you uh, uh, experienced as a Native woman when you got your diagnosis? In both cases, in both their experiences, it's touched me too also because of the insurance. Contract Health couldn't decide whether I qualified or what with the Public Health Service in Santa Fe. But how I came about discovering, um, I was taking a shower, leathery hands, and I discovered a little, little lump in my breast. And uh, I waited two weeks. I, like, I, like, she, like she said, um, it's not supposed to happen to you. It happens to other people. but. Then I, uh, it took a uh, while for me to decide to go, and it was like about two weeks. Then I went to Dr. DeLavalle in Santa Fe at the Public Health Service. And uh, she sent me for a mammogram, but nothing came back Yeah, positive. There was just gray matter and that I shouldn't worry about it. But then uh, my dad used to say, you know your body the best more than anybody or any doctor will. So that's what took me back to the doctor, and she sent me to uh, Santa Fe Imaging and uh, got me, put me through MRI. They did a biopsy, and when they told me it was positive, uh, numb, nothing. You don't know, have no, I didn't have no feelings. Mm. I wasn't sad. I wasn't thinking of death. I was just like numb. So I went home, went straight to my, I walked into the house because I lived alone. I went straight to my prayer corner and took my cornmeal and I started talking because my dad says, don't ever pray in silence, talk out. And my dad, mm, he passed on. And I remember what he had said. So I says, well, Father God and Daddy, I'm home. You know the diagnosis. So I said, um, you're the great physician. And I want to, I don't, I'm not going to accept this cancer. I can't deny the diagnosis, but I'm not going to accept the cancer in my body. I said, so I have to, I said, take my hand now, prepare me for this battle. Just like you prepare your, our boys for war. I have a war in my hands. I said, I can go through it with you. So that's how I took it. And uh, I said, thank you. I breathed the healing in. I, I sect that healing right now, I said. And I turned around and I went, whoa, you know. <laughs> I said, whoa, I cleaned the healing. <laughs> I turned around, opened the door, walked to the door and opened it and it says, by cancer, out. And I turned around and says, wow, healing is starting right now. So I went about my daily business and and getting scheduled, that's what I concentrated on, getting to the doctor and for surgery or whatever and to learn more about it. What are some of the challenges you guys try to uh, address mm -hmm. getting people to talk about cancer? And what we try to, to validate is, you know what, in order for us to be there for our families and our kids and our community, we need to be there for ourselves. We need to be able to make that time to get that screening and to reach out. And so here's what we're going to talk about today. How do we do that? That's a particular way. It's an effective way to message that for Latino, Hispanic right. women who and are used to perhaps putting everyone else first. Exactly. The other part of that is that the women in the community who are, um, are able to feel comfortable with the women who have cancer or survivors, and they hear their story. So they are role modeling. There's a woman there that they can associate with breast cancer and early detection. And the women themselves share these stories. And so now the women leave there believing and feeling, OK, now I have the knowledge. They watch a video. They partake in 
the, we also take part in debunking those myths. So there are some myths, so for example, yeah. about um, radiation, getting radiation from the mammogram, or um, you know, what's safe, what's not safe, or um, you know, do I, can I even get one? I have no medical insurance. So a lot of discussion happens in those classes. So that's one of the challenges that we address. And then the other thing is the emotional support that Dalila said. Women need to be able to talk about their experience with other women, regardless of who you are, whatever experience you've had, whether it's even a chronic disease, that you feel, right, that you're with people that understand you, that you're with people that you can trust. So today we have Spanish-speaking support groups in English. They share and they talk about spiritual prayer, they talk about their familias, they talk about their cancer, they, they support one another. So uh, that's one of the other components. Uh, you talked about myths. Um, we have some health, community health workers from our Pueblo <laughs> communities, and I want to ask Iris and Simon, as community health workers, do you encounter that? Are there myths about cancer that prevents people from talking about it? A lot of the Native Americans our Pueblo people are afraid to go see doctors because of, I mean, we don't want to learn anything bad that is happening to our, our, our health. And one, as everybody has hit the note on translation, you know, when we go and visit the doctors, we're here nodding our heads because, you know, do we really understand what our diagnosis is? As natives, we have prayers that we um, we do every day and we ask for prayers and you know we think it's okay it shouldn't happen to us Pueblo Indians you know it's not going to come into our communities but it's all over it I mean, cancer doesn't pick a person it just sometimes genetic or sometimes <coughs> just taking care how you take care of your health mm. so um, when you know, when Miss Bird, when I was still working in um, Santo Domingo, had come for assistance, you know, I had no clue about what cancer was. We need to get our community health representatives educated so we can be out there to be in support. We need the resources to help our community members. And just to um, add on to what Iris has said is that as, as Pueblo Indians, you know, we're I think we're kind of in denial of our cancer stuff. What I realized in the last 10, 15, 15 years that there is an increase of people getting cancer. Mm -hmm. And as Mrs. Bird has mentioned about Indian Health Service, you know, the contract, mm -hmm. uh, there's no funds, um, people are afraid, um, people don't understand what cancer is about. Um, there's a lot of people that are that do have cancer in their problem. And you're saying with IHS with Indian Health Services, the contract you're not sure you're, what services you're eligible. Well, for? there isn't much. Or there's, <laughs> there's not, not enough not, services. There's not enough there's services. Not enough money. There's okay. not okay. enough money to, to go to around. Qualify. Um, in the past, what, 12, 12 years, um, they did away with a lot of services mm -hmm. in, in uh, Indian Health Service. Uh -huh. um, medical, dental, whatever. So, and then when you go to contract for mammogram, uh, colonoscopy, whatever, um, you have to apply and, you know, we wait, don't have insurance. A lot of people don't have insurance. Are these similar to what you're seeing, Jean, at Zia Pueblo? Yes. We used to have uh, the, the mobiles come up and have that service provided for our women. But now, then they're on waiting lists. Individuals that have insurances, those ones will get in for a mammogram faster. Our CHR program has been involved with the Native American uh, Cancer Education Leadership Institute, mm -hmm. uh, which came out of UNM. That's along. community health worker? Yes. Commun okay. Community health representatives. Representative. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we went and we came up with the Cancer 101 curriculum. When somebody gets diagnosed with whatever, you know, uh, disease, then we're usually involved to go in and do a one-to-one -one education. But that's where, that's the patient's prerogative. Some of our community members don't want 
their community members, their families, to even know that they've been diagnosed with mm -hmm. this. Mm. They want to tackle it themselves. We're letting them know it's all right. It's all right to go through the the crying, the, you know, acceptance. Let me ask Dr. Chacon, there are a lot of challenges you're facing. In Native communities, we are constantly dealing with what we call contract health services or preferred um, care. Who's going to pay for this? How is it going to get paid? So there are many challenges when it comes to, to cancer and many other chronic disease. I think real basic is education. As a founder of Center for Native American Health at the University of New Mexico, uh, we began that Cancer 101 training, which was um, taking modules that had been uh, created in the Northwest tribes and modifying that to Southwest culture, Southwest tribes, what we have to deal with here in New Mexico around cancer, providing that uh, at the community level, not at the institution, mm -hmm. in the community with trainer trainers being CHRs. Why is that important to be at the community level versus when you have to come to Albuquerque to the Cancer Center or to Santa Fe? You're safe. You're home. You're with family. You get to speak what you want to say. You're, you hope that things are honest and you're at a, you're at a level playing field. When you're at the institution, you expect to go there for uh, treatment. Maybe sometimes even, I think, we feel like you go there sometimes to get bad news, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to die, mm -hmm. which is not, is, is not good. So bring this to the community and have, have people in the community talk about um, their perspective their home, their safe, what's the support? How can we garner what's here, cultivate what's here in our community to respond to the needs? What I think is so significant about what Dr. Chacon is saying is that we find a very similar thing. We bring the classes to where the women are. It's not just right the mammogram, but it's everything else that goes that, that, that presents a challenge to getting that. And so to have women that look like them, talk like them, come from that same uh, culture, in our case, we find that it opens up that discussion so that we're able to understand what really are those things that keep us from, you know, um, uh, getting, getting screened or, or even going to see a doctor and, and understanding that better. Emily, I want to ask you this brings me to some of the work you are doing right now at UNM. We've recorded stories of survivors. Why are you doing this? We're going through our lives and we receive our care in Indian Health Service um, facilities for our whole lives. That's where we go. And I know this from my own life. I grew up going to IHS and we would talk about it. You only go to um, like St. Vincent's to die or to get really bad news, like Dr. Chacon was saying. And so when you're going for, to get cancer, that's completely outside your comfort zone. There is a history of unethical practice in Native American communities in the world of medicine. And this has kind of trickled down into the community so that uh, there's just no, there's a lot of mistrust. And it affects the way people feel about healthcare. Mm. Uh, so I noticed this in my research that there was a lot of mistrust and so I developed a program to, to, to make these things called digital stories. They're short three to five minute videos where people talk about their own experiences of going through um, cancer and cancer treatment or family members who'd gone through cancer treatment. And then I took them and played them in a native serving clinic to see if they changed the way people feel about um, healthcare in general, to see if they affected that mistrust. Do you have any insights yet? I know you're still crunching your data. I'm still crunching my data. I'm really hoping that they actually change the way people feel about their, their healthcare in general. But I did find that just going through the digital story um, process about making the digital stories was a really transformative experience. That when people talked about their uh, cancer when, they, when people made their stories, it really um, 
made them feel better about the experience in general. Telling your story is important. There's still greater incidences of cancer in the Anglo community in New Mexico, but the outcomes are worse for the communities of color. Historically, uh, the rates or the risks of developing cancer were the highest in the Anglo population, in the non-Hispanic white population, um, and somewhat lower in Hispanics, and the lowest actually in the native communities. That's changed. Something has changed in the last 100 years. Now there is cancer here, and although the risks of cancer overall are slightly lower in the native communities, those risks are changing. The good news for native communities and Hispanic communities are that in general, your risk of developing cancer is less, but the bad news is, is that among people who do develop cancer, they tend to be diagnosed at later stages, suggesting that we're not being as effective with screening as we could be. Uh, and as a result, probably your chances of dying from the same cancers are greater. Do we and know what the barrier, we've talked about some of the barriers, but what are some of the barriers to getting those screenings or early interventions? Uh, like Ms. Pino already said, we're not getting the mammogram uh, van coming out to the communities. There's tremendous distance, and this is true for all rural communities. Just getting yourself to a facility that has the screening available to them is, is a major barrier. IHS, Indian Health Service, can't pay for a lot of uh, screening. So if you need something that is uh, outside of what they can pay for in one of their facilities, you need to get Contract Health to pay for it. Contract health is very complicated, um, and so the, what we've been talking about is signing up, getting on a waiting list, all of these things. That's a huge barrier to screening. So a pap test, something that you can go into a facility and they can do very simply, that, that you can get. But if you need a colonoscopy, you better get in line. And that is colon cancer is one of the cancers that's rising. And you know, another, just to add on to that though, we're, we talk about screening. We certainly want to promote screening. But that's not the end of the story. It's provision of care quickly and appropriate care, culturally competent care. I think this, this uh, topic bridges very nicely with the previous topic about the role of CHRs and promotoras and community health workers in general in that um, the, the, as critical as they are in the community, and I think CHRs and, and community health workers in general play a, a primordial role in the community, they also play an important role in bridging the gap between some of the fears that community members have in accessing health care that at some point invariably will be needed in Albuquerque or Santa Fe or outside of the, the community setting. And the community health workers, CHRs, can play a, a, um, a, a navigator role in mm. helping community members understand what awaits them when they do step outside the community. The CHRs, the navigator, the promotoras are all critical in not only understanding these barriers and challenges, now you're going to turn to this healthcare system and say, hello, can you make these changes please? That's a great segue into our next segment where we'll start talking about solutions. So. Hold tight, and we're going to add in a few people and be right back. <laughs>